but saying that this could not have been possible without my collaborators, Jackie Young, Kessler Tanner, Alex Owell, and my co-advisor, Sean Fulmer. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to start by talking about how we interact with our devices. Uh, physical controls have rich haptic feedback, which makes them easy to localize and manipulate, uh, and they can be highly specialized for a given task. On the other hand, virtual controls, such as those on a touchscreen, are dynamic uh, and can adapt to fit a variety of different contexts. So our question, of course, is, can we have the best of both worlds? That is, can our devices have familiar physical controls, which can reconfigure as virtual controls do? For example, when I play a game on my mobile device, the phone is probably not configured with the buttons that I need to control my character. So instead, I tap virtual buttons on the screen. <clears throat> The prototype you see here is called Shift.io. Uh, in this clip, the user opens a game application on a mobile device, and in response, the device configures these two touch responsive buttons to be used as the physical control. In contrast to conventional on-screen controls, these buttons provide better feedback, they free up screen space for the game, uh, and they reduce occlusion. Now, before I describe what that is in our approach, uh, I'll briefly mention some prior systems which have addressed similar problems. So uh, Harrison and Hudson augmented the, the screen with 2.5D actuation to create these physical controls that are coincident with the display. Um, however, these 2.5D elements can render only a fixed subset of configurations. Uh, further, interactions on the screen also occlude uh, the display, and this approach requires significant re-engineering of mobile displays. Others, such as Hemmer et al., have uh, augmented individual control elements with actuation, such as the addition of a shape-changing button. However, this approach also has limited reconfigurability and also requires dedicated mechanical components for each control element. Thus, it doesn't scale well for power, size, and cost considerations. Finally, earlier work from our lab augmented the edge of a mobile device with a shape display-like reconfigurable set of pins, which can form arbitrary interactive elements and provide feedback. This approach is advantageous because it allows us to rapidly reconfigure to produce a wide range of controls. Um, however, these control elements are limited in resolution, they draw significant amounts of power, and as 2.5D elements, they don't support lateral motion to enable sheer interactions along the edge. That is, the user cannot move elements along the device, such as in a slider or scrubber. <clears throat> so in general, the Shift.io prototype I briefly showed is a realization of a new type of interface that we call the reconfigurable tactile element interface. In an RTE interface, physical interactive elements called RTEs can appear on a device, relocate, reconfigure, combine, and disappear to generate various controls, to provide haptic feedback, and to enable tactile display. <clears throat> the prototype I showed with its design and its interactions is just one possible type of RTE interface out of a much larger design space. So before describing our implementation in detail, I'll briefly give an overview of some possible interactions on RTE interfaces. <clears throat> Firstly, there are a number of ways to use RTEs for user input. For example, while buttons are simple interactors which respond to a touch command, toggles can reconfigure to update their state both visually and haptically following each touch interaction. Sliders enable the user to scrub a value in a given range. <clears throat> elements to enable gestural interactions such as zooming. In addition to input, RTBEs can be used for physical output and feedback. So by imparting forces directly onto the user's hands, RTEs can provide uh, notifications or feedback to the user. <clears throat> Similarly, we can use the configuration of multiple RTEs to physically display information, such as multiple elements representing scheduled events throughout the day. And finally, we can adjust the force felt by the user as they move an RTE, allowing us to provide feedback in the form of haptic detents. Lastly, we can utilize a number of different par paradigms when combining reconfigurable physical controls with visual displays of devices. So in mirroring, the RTEs assume the function of controls present on the display, providing an additional physical handle and feedback for virtual controls. In complementing, the RTEs instead serve as the primary controls for the content of the display, freeing up the screen space. For example, we could shift video playback controls from the screen to the edges of the device, enabling the user to control the video playback in true full screen. <clears throat> and finally, in extending, the RTEs represent content not present on the display at all to increase the expressive capabilities of the device. So for example, we can use RTEs to represent interactive tangible notifications, which can alert the user while they're engaged in another task. <clears throat> 
So for our realization of a reconfigurable tactile element interface, we created two prototype devices that we call Shift.io. Shift.io augments an existing mobile device with an RTE interface. We manipulate a number of which can travel around the exterior of a device and disappear within its interior. Here's what that hardware looks like. Uh, note how we can store RTEs hidden within the device when unused and then draw them out for use in a given configuration, allowing us to add or remove controls as needed for a particular application. We implemented two versions of Shift.io using different actuation mechanisms. The first is designed for flexibility and a thin form factor, while the second is designed to reduce the average power consumption of the system. I'll briefly describe and compare these two approaches, starting with the first, uh, the PCB microcoil prototype. So uh, there are a number of technical considerations in designing this implementation to support all of our interactions. We could, for example, mechanically drive these RTEs with cables or belts, or we could use linear actuators such as shape memory alloys or pneumatic actuators. So what factors influence this design decision? Uh, firstly, we need the, design, uh, the device to be compact. We also need it to support reconfiguring a number of elements at once. We find scaling to be the primary issue behind mechanical systems like cables, which quickly grow in size and complexity uh, for multiple actuated components. Next, we need to consider how much force it can output to the user and how robust it is to external forces. Uh, obviously, belts and actuators will have a greater max force output than magnetic approaches, uh, but may be less readily backdrivable, having a number of moving parts which can break when the user or external forces attempt to move elements. <clears throat> Cost is a consideration as well. Uh, mechanical components tend to add up in price, whereas modern fabrication techniques allow us to manufacture PCBs very cheaply. Uh, and finally, we must consider power consumption, which can vary greatly depending on the technologies used. So in light of these considerations, our implementations use a magnetic drive approach. The exterior of the device is lined with a flexible PCB with a number of small coils. Pulse width modulation of a transistor on each coil allows us to control the current flowing through the coil, uh, which generates magnetic fields. The base of the RTE is also magnetic, and the resulting attraction both holds the RTE onto the surface of the PCB and allows us to micro-step RTEs across the surface and around the edges of the device. Here's a visualization of what that micro-stepping looks like. The amount of current flowing through the coil is, showing, is shown by the color red, so the RTE is pulled along by the magnetic fields generated by the changing current. The flexible PCB is actually composed of four very thin layers, uh, strengthening the total magnetic force at a given location. Every other layer is offset to increase the positional resolution. Uh, that PCB sits atop a soft potentiometer, which can sense inputs when the user presses down the device, a mechanical track, constrains the motion of the RTE to the linear dimension uh, and prevents the element from detaching if perturbed by a large force. The entire system is driven by an Arduino microcontroller, uh, which communicates via Bluetooth with a host device. Applications can then make high-level API calls. For example, they can request the repositioning of any given element, and the Shift.io hardware manages the appropriate control. The second prototype operates similarly to the first, but explores as a proof of concept the use of switchable permanent magnets as an actuation mechanism, resulting in reduced power consumption for many applications. As a brief overview, a switchable permanent magnet consists of a permanent magnet with a low deer wrapped in a solenoid. By briefly pulsing current through the wire for several microseconds, the resulting magnetic field repolarizes the permanent magnet. Uh, thus, when the current stops, the magnet remains in the new polarization. Prototype with switchable permanent magnets, and we microstep the RTE above them in the same fashion as in the previous prototype. Uh, it takes more power than before. However, because the permanent magnet holds the RTE in place without the need to constantly supply current, uh, we need only power the coils when actively moving the RTE along the device. Since control elements can often remain in a given position for relatively long stretches of time, this can save a great deal of power in many applications. This graph compares the power efficiency of these two prototypes and describes the applications where each is advantageous. On the x-axis, we show the speed at which we move an RTE. And on the y-axis, we show the fraction of total operation time spent and then shows the region at which the two prototypes are equally power efficient. For example, if an element moves at 50 millimeters per second, time reconfiguring into new positions, then the switchable magnet uh, implementation is advantageous. 
So to put this in context, uh, the game application I introduced at the start of the talk might be most efficient with a switchable magnet implementation, since the controls reconfigure once and then remain in place. Uh, someone constantly receiving and dismissing notifications represented by RTEs might make better use of the PCB microcoil variant, since elements are frequently in motion. Now, I'd like to show a few basic applications and interactions leveraging the capability of Shift.io in various ways. So here's the most basic example of an interactive toggle on Shift.io. The dynamic physical control mirrors the toggle on the display, allowing the user to control the input or to check its state with just a touch. Here we show the use of an RTE to haptically represent information. So when reading a passage of text, a scroll bar appears to show the user's place in the text as well as to allow the user to scroll through the passage with a physical slider. This tactile display can also be used for ambient notifications. So here we use the position of an element in one dimension to quickly give a sense of the number of unread messages. We could instead have used uh, multiple RTEs for these notifications where the number of elements represents the number of messages. We can also use the RTE for both visual and haptic feedback. So here the edges of this device pulse with an incoming call notification. This is one example of uh, glanceable feedback. That is, uh, the user can simply touch their device to query some state variable. By intentionally bringing the RTEs into close proximity, we can then join them together to form larger elements. These elements can then be moved and interacted with as one. And the flexibility of Shift.io makes it possible to implement in different form factors. So here we show a 3D printed wristwatch prototype, demonstrating how RTE interfaces could leverage the band of a smartwatch to provide controls and feedback outside of the limited screen space of a device. Now, the design of these prototypes yields a number of advantages, but there's still several limitations to overcome. Firstly, while our average power consumption is less than many shape-changing devices, uh, we can still improve it a great deal. For example, in the flexible PCB variant, we could line the bottom of the PCB layer with a ferromagnetic material, allowing RTEs not in motion to remain in place through magnetic attraction uh, without the need to continuously Next, the biggest drawback of a magnetic approach is the low force output in the lateral direction. Uh, that is, the RTEs cannot push or resist with great force because the attractive force is primarily in the normal direction. Uh, magnets also interact. Uh, when operating RTEs in close proximity without intentionally joining them, a minimum separation on the order of 15 millimeters is currently necessary. Uh, right now, we're investigating magnetic shielding materials to help us reduce this distance dramatically. Uh, and finally, Continually switching magnetic fields over the RTEs for long periods of time can result in the induction of eddy currents, uh, leading to heating or possibly even depolarization of these magnetic elements. This can be reduced by using laminated or high resistance magnets, but it is a current limitation of our prototypes. So in addition to iterating on the system design to address these limitations, we have a number of directions for future work, uh, starting with more sophisticated sensing to enable more robust control of the system. Uh, though currently the position of the RTE is detected as the user presses down into the soft potentiometer, our prototypes do not actively sense the position of elements at all times. Adding Hall effect sensors along the edge of the device would allow us to track elements which have uh, been knocked out of position or otherwise prevented from reaching their destination. Then we'd like to implement more complex types of input, such as the ability to differentiate between various touches and gestures. And finally, with a few design modifications, we could configure controls in multiple dimensions, greatly expanding our ability to use tactile display to show various interactive shapes, such as here are these play and pause uh, or stop buttons for media controls. And of course, as mentioned before, our implementation is just one possible instantiation of an RTE interface. So we hope to further explore this design space and create new types of interfaces to explore the different interactions that emerge under these different design parameters. That includes exploring RTE interfaces on devices across different scales, everything from laptop computers and game controllers to interfaces in the car and in large Internet of Things appliances. So to summarize, we present the reconfigurable tactile element interface and in our paper explore various design considerations. We demonstrate Shift.io, two prototype devices utilizing magnetic actuation techniques to augment existing mobile and wearable devices. And we evaluate the technical considerations of these approaches in the paper as well. And finally, we demonstrate applications for and interactions using these reconfigurable tactile element interfaces. So with all of that, I'd like to thank my collaborators on this project and uh, specifically acknowledge our friend Sung Jun Jong, who worked very hard with us on the design of our flexible PCB. Um, I apologize for the video issues, and I thank you all for sitting through it with me. So if there's any time, I would love to take questions. <laughs>
Hello. Um, Laura Ulberg from the University of Calgary. This is super cool. Um, one very detailed question, just out of curiosity. How mm -hmm. loud is it? Um, um, it's silent. Uh, okay. Yeah. And second question is, have you uh, looked at the scalability of this yet? So have you seen how many of these you can put in before you start? Yes, it varies uh, on each of the prototypes, actually. So um, we can support multiple elements. Uh, so I mentioned the minimum separation distance. Um, the only limitation is that we properly shunt current through these coils um, because provided you have a power supply with adequate current, you could fuel as many of these coils as you want. Um, heating problems, power dissipation problems, et cetera. Um, so I think generally we're limited by uh, the, the closeness that we can get these elements. Um, but we haven't stress tested this in any sense, so I don't want to give you any false information. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Um, Diane from MIT Media Lab. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I noticed was the geometry of the coils that's driving the uh, RT element is sort of a circular. Mm -hmm. Have you tested other patterns? Uh, you might have come across um, SRI's examples of uh, the micro robots yeah. on an array with, on a grid pattern. Yeah, so we, we were very much inspired by the SRI work. Um, and we did uh, various simulations. Some of that's in the paper, although I'm not sure how much of it at this point. Uh, to we, we did finite element analysis to essentially model the different uh, magnetic fields we would get over the different coil structures. Um, and so we decided, given the PCB limitations, that is the minimum thickness of the trace, um, we found the ideal radius, uh, which uh, is on the order of a couple of millimeters, uh, and then the ideal number of turns per coil, because the additional number of turns increase the resistance, uh, and then you have uh, uh, interactions with the power constraints. Um, so we've done all that simulation in the paper. Um, as for multiple shapes, um, I think we went with the circle just because it was the easiest for us to model, and it made the most sense in terms of you know having a coil. Um, but uh, I haven't tried it, and it would be interesting to see how the performance changes on these different patterns. So happy to talk to you if you have <laughs> advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I was just curious what your status is with regard to like two-dimensional grids. Yeah. Um, so we think that's really interesting. It's also very challenging. Uh, so uh, I think some of the benefits that you get uh, in that respect are not only that you can model different shapes and you can have richer tactile display, but also you can do certain things like uh, in the paper we talk about how when elements move into position, sometimes that motion can be misconstrued as you know intentional motion of the element. So by having multiple tracks, whether or not the, the dimensions are all visible to the user, whether they're internal to the device, you can do things like uh, move elements into position before you bring them into the interactable or visible region. Um, we, uh, as for status, don't have a prototype that works in, in two dimensions yet, but you can imagine, you know, simply as a hack, lining up multiple of these coils and operating them individually. Um, I don't think that's very elegant, and I think that we can do a lot better work in that space, which is why I don't have anything to show you, but it's definitely a really exciting thing for us. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank